You're listening to Thunder Quack Podcast Network. Hi, this is Roy Thomas, and you're listening to the Epic Marvel Podcast. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Epic Marvel Podcast. This episode is Conan the Barbarian, Episode 1, covering a period of Conan the Barbarian from 1970 to 1972. This is our first episode of Conan the Barbarian, and I'm joined today by my special guest, Jason Cretton. Hi, Jason. Hello. Uh, Tell us a little bit about yourself. Who are you? And... um, Feel free to, I know you have a po- podcast that you want to plug. Uh, yeah, well, I do two podcasts, both uh, well, both currently on hold. Uh, as you know, time has become a precious thing. Yes. Uh, Whorehound Radio being the main one. Uh, now, that is mostly about horror movies, but on a few episodes, I do sneak in comic talk. That's and then funny. I do another one that's specifically about comic books called Night of the Comic uh, that originally started as a Patreon benefit for a, another friend's podcast. But since then, uh, it's no longer a Patreon exclusive thing. If you go to Night of the Living podcast and search for uh, Night of the Comic within there, you'll find all of our episodes for free. That's great. Where it is just three guys hanging out talking about comics. You know, that's what I love. And that's what this podcast here is also. <laughs> and then, oh, I should also plug uh, the Night of the Comic Instagram page because that I try to at least keep somewhat active. And that's literally just me posting about comic books I'm reading and stuff like that, stuff from my collection. Perfect. So we're going to talk today about Conan the Barbarian. And this is uh, not a regular superhero comic. It's not tied in with the 616 universe or anything like that. It stands on its own in the history of Marvel Comics. Uh, what What is your history with Conan, Jason? Uh, I was actually thinking about that with, right before we recorded. My first experience would be, I would imagine, most kid of the 80s would be the Arnold Schwarzenegger movie. Right. I mean, that I probably saw at way too young of an age. <laughs> yeah. Like most movies back then. But... Uh, even I was even a fan of the very short-lived uh, cartoon they did. Oh yeah, they did that right after Conan the Destroyer. I think that was like you know mid to late eighties. They did a very short-lived cartoon that I loved. That's um, right. What was that one called? Was it called Conan the Adventurer? Yes. Yeah, that's right. I can tell you that that does not withstand the test of time. No. <laughs> yeah. Right. And that one does not hold up. Most 80s cartoons don't hold up as well as you want them to, that's for sure. That was part of that odd uh, trend when they were making very adult movies into children's cartoons. Yeah, RoboCop had one as well. Rambo. Yeah, Rambo, that's right. (laughs) Yep, I don't know what that was, but I fell for them all. That's great. And then uh, after that... uh... I mean, I would pick up the comics here and there, the Marvel. Like, I I never picked them up from the beginning when I first started collecting comics. Yeah. You know, I would pick up random issues out of, you know, clearance bins and such. Oddly enough, I really picked it up when Dark Horse got the title. Okay. Uh, Back in 03, I think, is when they started publishing it. Maybe 02 is when Dark Horse started publishing. And then uh, I started actually working at a bookstore, which I've worked at a bookstore now for about 16 years. Wow. And that was instant. Like, my first week of working there, I picked up a copy of Robert E. Howard's book, Brand Mac Morn, simply because of the Frank Rosetta cover. Oh, yeah. And because it's said from the creator of Conan and because of that book I said I gotta start Conan from the beginning like this is something again I've watched that movie so many times I might as well get into the source material so you've read all the books now well uh I've read all the Robert E. Howard okay some would say that that's that's all you need to read (laughs) Conan well Conan has a weird publishing history kind of because you know when I first got into it god I wish I would bring him out 
uh, I think it was Del Rey yeah. published a series of just the Robert E. Howard stories in chronological order, and that's what I initially read. And there is a oddly specific uh, branch of Conan fandom that only go by Robert E. Howard written stories. Right. But then I gradually started getting into the more expanded universe, where the author uh, Le Sprague de Camp, we'll say that, okay, and Lynn Carter back in the 50s, you know, I, I'm going off on a Conan tangent here. That's okay. But they they were huge Robert E. Howard fans, specifically DeCamp, and he went through, he was the first person that really kind of put them in order and then also uh, found some unpublished stories and then also some non-Conan Robert E. Howard stories and decided to make them Conan. So right. I jumped into those paperbacks. That actually is my current addiction. Nice. Okay. So I have not read all of these yet because these are actually specifically no- numbered one through nine. Okay. And then as far as the comics go, you say you haven't picked up, you never picked up them on a regular basis, but since then, have you gone back and explored oh, them? Oh, well, yes. Yeah, so I guess I should have said that after the Dark Horse stuff, you know, I have a good friend who's also a pretty big Conan fan. He's the biggest Conan fan I know that kind of uh, pushed and said, like, if you're reading all this stuff, why are you not reading those original Marvel comics? Yeah, good. And it was like, oh, that's a good point. But again, it, it's a weird thing. I have this bad habit of any fandom I get into uh, getting a bit elitist, if I, had, if I can say that. <laughs> so... It did take me a minute because I was such, you know, well, if it's not Robert E. Howard, why am I reading it? And then knowing that a lot of these Marvel comics branched out from it, that especially got me. Right. Like, I don't know if I'm going to, you know, how dare they mess with Conan continuity? (laughs) How little did I know? Yeah, no kidding. And at this point, there's probably a richer history in the comics than there is in the novels now because there's just so much material. Absolutely. I think Roy Thomas who obviously is the person we'll be talking about the most during this. Yeah. He had some comment about uh, first getting into the DeCamp Carter timeline and saying, it seems like every time Conan stubbed his toe, like there had to be a story written about it. <laughs> right. <laughs> Awesome. Well, I should mention, now that you've mentioned uh, Roy Thomas, I did try and get an interview with Roy and with Barry Windsor Smith, but um, both haven't responded to my email. So I'm hoping that Mm -hmm. eventually I'll be able to talk to both of them. I've already talked to Roy a bunch of times about a bunch of stuff. He's open to interviews. I just think timing never worked out or something, but Barry hasn't responded to my messages. So hopefully that will come down the road and I'll be able to insert some clips into uh, some future that episodes. Be, that would be so cool. Yeah, totally. Have you ever talked to Windsor Smith? No, no, I haven't. So I'm hoping that this I'm will curious. be a, a springboard on, uh, to something, to maybe a few different interviews. I'd like to talk to him about Weapon X as well, you know? Oh, yeah. Um, okay, so my association with Conan is similar to yours, where I think I probably saw... No, actually, no. I, I was going to say I saw the movie first. I I didn't see it as a kid. I saw the movie as an adult, actually, not too long ago from right now. I think the first Conan book I ever read was the free Dark Horse comic, which was the very first mm-hmm. Conan that they did when they originally got the license. They they had a, a freebie issue that they yep. they handed out, and I read that, and it actually didn't. I had no interest in it, so I didn't even mm. bother to uh, to to read any more of it. You know, I, I've growing up with the superheroes, the the whole fantasy side, like this side of things, never really interested me. Um, and that goes the same for like Lord of the Rings and, you know, a- anything. Really? Hmm. I, it was just, yeah, I was way more on the science fiction side than on the fantasy side. That's changed since I've been an, become an adult. I've been way more open to, to experiencing more of this kind of stuff. And now that uh, these epic collections are coming out, I'm giving Conan a chance. So this is actually my first time reading through these these Conan issues and discovering the world of Conan. And boy, is it fun. I'm totally having a great time. So, uh, and I understand that it just keeps on getting better past this first issue, this first volume as well. So (laughs) that's very, very cool. These first 13 issues were such a great introduction. Yeah, absolutely. Especially, you know, not to jump ahead, but, you know, I even think about the first issue rereading. I've read that first issue a few times now. But it's such a great introduction to not just Conan, but his entire world. Yeah. So I should mention that we are going to talk about Conan the Barbarian numbers 1 to 13 
and a short story from Chamber of Darkness number four. Uh, and so we'll get into why we're talking about Chamber of Darkness number four in a little bit. Uh, but I want to actually first read a few listener comments because I asked on Twitter and on Instagram for people to give their impressions about these first 13 issues as collected in this epic collection here. So on Twitter, let's see here, we have uh, someone with the handle Bill is Busy. He says, uh, great news, I've missed the show. I've been on hiatus, so thank you, uh, Bill, for uh, mentioning that. Or Sandrock741, that's the actual Twitter handle. Um, he says, I like this volume due to Conan's wandering ways and, of course, the Barry Windsor Smith art. It was a fun look into seeing how ba Barry Windsor Smith developed his art style as the issues progressed. That's a very big point. It's a huge is point. That he started literally as the definition of a Kirby clone. Yeah. In fact, I remember even at a younger age, the first time I ever saw the first issue of Conan number one, I assumed it was Jack Kirby. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah. That first image, I still look at it. And, but to see how he then went completely on his own path. Totally. And we will definitely talk about the art and that style when we get into the issue, because there's some, yeah, so there's some things I want to mention about that too, some, some specific examples. Uh, and we're going to see that comment come up a lot in these, in these reader comments. Uh, so we have another one from Vanquisher Sarcastic. This one says, uh, the first issue was a really good first issue, in my opinion. It was a good setup for the rest of the series going forward. This epic collection also features adaptations for Robert E. Howard's Tower of the Elephant, my favorite Conan story, and Rogues in the House. So yeah, we'll talk about uh, those stories mm -hmm. a little bit too. Okay, another one from uh, the handle Kid Flash says, I think the first 13 issues are the foundation of what made Conan a success at Marvel. Tower of the Elephant kicked it into gear. I also loved Devil Wings over Sh uh, Shadazar. I thought, yeah. I thought Sal Buscema's inks over a young Barry Smith were very nice. Uh, yes, very much. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. Okay, over on Instagram, uh, we have one comment from Stir PDS. I don't know what that means, but that's their, their <laughs> Instagram handle. Um, it says, some stories are okay, some bad. I didn't care much for the art too, but overall, it's a fun read. If, <laughs> if only you like sword and sorcery stuff. So that's kind of a brutal comment there. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's not good for to everybody. Have a balance, I guess. Absolutely, it's not for everybody, and that's important to understand. And like I said, for the longest time, I wasn't into this fantasy stuff either. And if you're looking at this early Barry Windsor Smith stuff and comparing it to his older Barry Windsor Smith stuff, or sorry, the newer Barry Windsor stuff, like yeah, uh, like Weapon X or whatever, then sure, this is maybe not your cup of tea. That is interesting to hear someone criticize the art, but yeah, you know, art is very subject subjective. Absolutely. Okay, the Philist says, loving all the Conan epics. I've been reading all of the OG Conan, Conan epics as they come out and just started the Chronicles line, and wow, no previous Conan knowledge whatsoever, and I'm hooked. Hope they put the Savage line in epic collection as well. That's the Savage oh, sword. Oh, that would Conan, be, the that would be so great. Totally. I would, I would love that too. Yeah, I mean, it's all available in omnibus format, but... It was pretty pricey. They're they're very pricey. I just can't bring myself to drop that much all in one go, and and they're they're very big. I I would rather mm -hmm. have them in smaller paperback size, much easier to read, in my opinion. I don't disagree with that. And I'm just glad that there are enough people buying the Omnis that all of this stuff is being collected. There's like what seven of those savage sort of Conan Omnis uh, now or something. <laughs> <laughs> there might be even more now. Yeah, it could be. But they're just pumping them out, and I'm happy that people are buying them to keep that stuff in print. Well, like you said, that's the big thing is shelf space. Yeah. Okay, here's a really long Instagram handle. Tiago X... Oh, no, I see. Tiago Alex Andre Pessoa. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really long Instagram handle. It says Barry Windsor Smith's evolution was incredible. Case study material. Mm -hmm. I could agree with Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Yeah, and not just in the the way he draws, but in the way he tells a story. Really, really oh. evolves in the first thirty. Absolutely. Years. And then Brian Omnibus Comics Nerd says, I never read Conan as a kid and wasn't expecting much from the epic, but I loved it and now want all things Conan. I'm gutted. I dismissed Conan as a kid because he wasn't a typical superhero. Yeah, and I think I have that 
same sort of opinion there. Well, you know, it's interesting. I <laughs> to go on a little bit more of my history with Conan. Yep. When Dark Horse lost the license initially, I was not too happy, okay. you know, because I thought Dark Horse did such a great job with it. But hearing some of these those comments and hearing of people picking up Conan for the first time simply because it was in an epic form, kind of kind of makes me happy. Yeah. Yeah, some did some good did come out of that and people are discovering Conan for the first time and yeah, myself included. I mean, all of this Marvel stuff was reprinted by Dark Horse as well, but mm-hmm. you know, it's because I'm collecting these epic collections that I'm actually giving this a chance. Otherwise, I still probably wouldn't even think to to read Conan the Yeah, Barbarian. that makes me very happy. Yep. Just before we start, I want to say that this episode is brought to you by Dying Breed Collectors. If you would like to purchase any Epic Collections and take advantage of some excellent customer service and uh, really great packing and shipping uh, standards, then uh, go over to Dying Breed Collectors and enter Epic Marvel Podcast, all one word, as a promo code for 10% off any Epic Collection that you buy through them. Oh, yeah. Well, why don't we move over into our our issues here? Uh, We're going to start with um, this short story from Chamber of Darkness. So this this short story is called The Sword and the Sorcerers, written by Roy Thomas and illustrated by Barry Smith. And this is very much a precursor to Conan. And in the epic collection, right under the cover, it's written six months before Conan's debut, Star the Slayer was introduced to test the interest in sword and sorcery comics. Yeah, uh, I didn't even know this comic existed until you told me about it. Right. And it's an okay read, and they, they throw in the science fiction as well, so it's not purely a sword mm-hmm. and sorcery um, comic story as well to, to kind of appeal to the comic the you know the science fiction fans that are typically Marvel fans but yeah we're, we're introduced to a writer um, well actually it's the, this whole story starts off with learning about uh, star the Slayer who's defeating this godlike creature and then it cuts to um, this guy waking up from a dream and apparently star was all the dream and this guy is a writer and he's trying to write a story. And I guess he's getting all of his stories from his dreams. Now, the science fiction aspect is that Star the Slayer gets pulled into the real world, and then he eventually Mm -hmm. gets pulled into the Star the Slayer world, and is kind of this weird thing where it's like, what is reality and all this kind of stuff. So it it plays it really kind of cool there. Um, And you can see a lot of the influence, like the helmet that Star the Slayer is wearing is the one that that, uh, Conan gets in the first couple issues here. I don't think they tried to hide that like this is what Conan's going to look like yeah I thought the story was interesting the thing that interested me the most was because you know when you read interviews with Roy Thomas and you hear his history with Conan uh, he studied a lot of Robert E. Howard Robert E. Howard did interviews where he would talk about how he tried to write other stories that weren't Conan but uh, kind of quoting him here Conan would kind of haunt his dreams Conan would he would find himself writing Conan stories even when he didn't want to. So I picked up a little hint of that in this story. Yeah, I can see that. I thought that that was an interesting touch. Totally, it would have been nice to uh, see this character come back in some way. I don't know if it's ever used again. Actually, funny enough, he is. Okay, perfect. A couple years ago, when Marvel had their Max line, they actually did a Star the Slayer mini series drawn by Richard Corbin of all people. Oh wow. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, so it's there one of those go. things that I, I passed it up so many times and now I kick myself because I see what it is. Yeah, the, the historical significance of that character, kind of cool. Yep. Now, when I read this issue, I wasn't too impressed with Barry Smith's storytelling. Um, it, it He's brand new at this time. Like he's written, mm-hmm. he's drawn like two comics before this. And so he's he's very green, and I can see that uh, he's. I think he's being a little too ambitious with some of his page layouts, which he tones down quite a bit for the first issue of Conan. But if you go to the fifth page in mm-hmm. this story, where um, we have we have to put little arrows in. Yep, <laughs> in that's the what box I was going to mention. In order for us to know how to how to read this properly. That right there is an automatic negative, unfortunately. 
Yeah, and I think editors usually have to place those to uh, to make sure that we know which direction we're supposed to read. Uh, I think we could have figured it out, though, without sure. the arrows. But the fact that this box, the one where it's just the face yelling, you, star, the fact that that box kind of, um, <laughs> it goes, oh, it's it's a trapezoid that goes over top of the two columns. Like it's not mm -hmm. contained to one column, so it could easily go in either direction, especially since the, the shape of the trapezoid is kind of like an arrowish pointing to the to the right hand column. Yep. So it's just bad planning in that sense, but uh, but oh well. Yeah, I mean it I mean you you said it right there. This was Barry Windsor Smith, very young yep. and working for Marvel, doing the Marvel method also for a young artist probably wasn't easy. I'm just also kind of uh, upset that it's only seven pages long because this whole uh, star coming into our world would have been yeah, kind of so nice to explore a little bit. I don't have it in front of me, uh, but I do remember. So I guess that people should ex expect spoilers here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, star comes out uh, and kills the author. Yes. Because he says, you know, you're the ultimate devil trying to kill me and then wakes up again in his own world and is confused. Or no, he starts talking about how he had a nightmare. Right. I believe. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's potential there for a cool story. Yeah, I I really do like the concept of he him killing the his own author. And yeah, it's like, is this guy just a creation and this guy in the author's head, or are his yeah, dreams the, actually opening up in a, an another reality? When you start breaking it down like that, I guess it does get a little bit confusing. <laughs> yep, and that's when okay. You're trying to find logic in it one of those short stories where it's like you come to your own conclusions at the end yeah i mean i i guess it worked yep. i mean if they were doing it as a test you know obviously we see what came from it so we don't have to dwell on this short story forever so let's keep on going to the next issue this is issue number one uh, the coming of conan uh, 1970. Um, I want to mention that in this epic collection, at the very beginning, they print a map of uh, yep. of the Hyborian Age, so we can kind of see um, all of the different places that Conan's going to be visiting in this book. In volume two of the epic collection, they actually print a copy of this map that was created uh, for... Um, the the reprint edition, I think, or or Marvel the Marvel mm -hmm. Treasury edition, and it has each issue marked uh, up to issue number twenty four uh, of where Conan is going in all of these issues. So it has like a red line throughout this that that shows us where where he's See, going. Now that's I didn't know that. I have, I do plan on getting that actual epic collection because I just decided I need it. Yeah. But they actually do that uh, in modern day. You know, Conan is in current 616 continuity now. Cool. And in his stories, uh, they actually do that exact same thing. And nice. a little red line going around the Marvel Universe. <laughs> that's awesome. It probably stems from this then, I guess. That's really, really good. So that's that's quite helpful because it gives me, um, it gives all of us some good context mm -hmm. of how he travels, how far he travels, and and um, the border relations, because a lot of yep. this is about the warring nations, and uh, and it's important to see who is on, uh, uh, like which country is neighboring which border. So that's good. Yeah, they do this. Uh, I also have a map of the Hyborian Age in the actual Robert E. Howard paperbacks, and when you compare them, they're pretty much dead on. Actually, I'm glad that they are consistent then. Uh, okay, so in the Epic Collection also, there is a lot of uh, bonus features, including some articles by Roy Thomas that he's written for various magazines, and uh, and they give a little bit of interest, uh, look, they give a little bit of a look into the creation of Conan, and um, I'm not going to read all of it because he writes quite a bit, but I will just kind of mm. break it down saying that um, this has been, this was an, an idea of his for a long time, when he stumbled upon one of Robert E. Howard's books, he said this would make a good adaptation, but everybody kind of warned him against it, um, against doing Conan. He starts this article saying, Conan certainly would make a great comic book hero. Everybody agreed upon that. Everyone except the dyed-in-the-wool purist who insisted upon a requisite volume of blood in each four-color issue. Everyone except the sheltered souls who felt that there was sure a lot of sex in Robert Howard's original Conan stories and felt that the tales couldn't survive without it. 
everyone except those who felt that Frazada was the only artist since Da Vinci, everyone except mm-hmm. those who thought it better not to put Conan the Sumerian into comics rather than to, uh, rather than to weaken the character to even the the minutest degree. And finally, everyone except me, he says. <laughs> so he was really fighting a, an uphill battle to try and uh, convince people that this would be a good thing to do. Uh, he goes on to say that um, time passed and, and he kind of forgot about it until he reconnected with the book sometime later. And it was at a comic convention where someone was asking him what would their dream project be. And he threw out Conan and that sort of spurred him to mm. get back into the game. And uh, Marvel hadn't done any licensed characters at that time. Um, they they had licensed stuff back in like the the timely Atlas days, but not since the Stanley Marvel era. And it would be some number of years still before Star Wars would be a thing at Marvel. Yeah. Uh, and so he decided to license not Conan because that was going to be kind of too expensive. But uh, to yeah, co- I like the story. Yeah. <laughs> he 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 went uh, and licensed Thongor the Barbarian. Yep. Lynn Carter. Yeah, Lynn Carter's book. And Lynn Carter would eventually go on to be a Conan writer, right? Mm-hmm. He's one of the people that uh, yeah helped make an established timeline with the camp. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's what you mentioned earlier. That's right. And and so, yeah, he, he went to license Thongor, but the people, uh, the Thongor people never got back to him. And they just uh, kind of ignored his email or didn't respond or didn't even see it. He doesn't even know. And yeah. and then, so he was like, okay, well, I might as well try Conan. <laughs> and so he tried Conan and uh, got the license. So fantastic. Good job, yeah. Roy. <laughs> that story is funny. He had... Uh... You know, what Martin Goodman gave him $150 and that's, he said, like, he's like, no one's going to sell their license for $150. And then, yeah, uh, Glenn Lord, the guy who was the uh, owner of Conan's rights at the time, jumped at it. Like, yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, it's amazing. Totally amazing. And Roy also goes on to say that his first choice for art duty was actually John Buscema. But mm-hmm. John was busy at the time. He was already on a book and uh, wasn't able to commit to a second title. So he had to go with somebody else. Um, you know, he would have loved to have Kirby or Starenko, mm-hmm. but uh, instead he chose um, Barry Windsor Smith, which is kind of a um, kind of a a risky take, I think, an untested mm-hmm. an untested guy. Oh, sorry, I got that wrong. One of the reasons why he couldn't hire price. John was the price. John was already an yep. established artist, and his page rate was too high for the budget he had for Conan. That's what it was. Yeah, the well, he went slightly over the 150, and he offered 200. Ah. Uh, and so that was one of the reasons he said, like, that's why he put himself on the book also. He said, I read an article that said he initially wanted uh, Jerry Conway to write it. Oh, okay. But that would have cost, again, so much money. Same thing with Yusema. So he just decided to do it himself and get wow. a rookie artist. Because he did, Roy Thomas did a few issues of Avengers with Barry Windsor Smith. Right. Like, literally, like, like you said, maybe two or three. Yeah, yeah, quite amazing. And he was over, Barry Windsor Smith is uh, British, so he's over in Europe. Mm-hmm. And the two of them have to work together to uh, to get this issue out. And they, they talk about... Um, Right when they got the first few pages, he, uh, Roy had to get Barry to redraw them because he just kind of uh, went straight into action and uh, didn't establish yeah. anything for the first issue. And it's like so, so they had to kind of redo what they were going to uh, what they're going to talk about here. Um, one of the actually very interesting before we actually get it, we haven't even talked about the contents of this issue yet. But mm-hmm. one of the <laughs> bonus features in this epic collection is the original plot outline from oh. from from Roy Thomas. Yeah, I need I need to get that epic. If anybody wants to know how the Marvel method works, uh, this is like the best example here. It gives you exactly how Roy pitch uh, like broke down each page so that uh, Barry could have something to work with and his plots are so generic that really you get the sense, you yeah. get the the complete sense that Barry is doing pretty much all of the heavy lifting in terms of the writing and storytelling. And Roy's coming in, like Roy has the initial idea, Barry takes it and turns yeah. it into a full comic. And then Roy comes in and, and adds the words afterwards. And like that's, that is how Marvel Comics historically well, were done. Do you hear how many stories of, you know, artists back then who were very unhappy with that method 
Yeah. Well, and then there's the the whole controversy of like who is the actual writer of the Fantastic sure. Four comics? Is it Kirby or is it Stan Lee? Like we really don't know. Yep. And it's because of this method. It's like then uh, not off topic, but didn't Wally Wood uh, quit Daredevil because of that? Yeah, I heard a story that he said, you know, I'm doing pretty much all the work and I'm only getting listed as an artist. <laughs> totally. Absolutely. A lot of people weren't happy with that, but then a lot of people actually loved doing it that way as well. Uh, so he th- here here's a great example. Right at the very end of this plot breakdown, which is four pages, right at the very end, uh, Roy says, I just, I'm going to read this as it's written here. I just realized I introduced this cute girl in the story and didn't do anything with her. Please have her more important in the story. <laughs> oh, maybe she's killed, or better yet, maybe Conan tries to be to be gallant and rescue her, but she turns out to be one of the uh, one of the, the the baddies with a spell over her and makes her human. It's like that was an afterthought. And he's like, um, he's like, Bad. oh, I just remember I didn't do anything. Uh, oh, I'm sure Barry, you can take care of that. Oh, just... by the way, cre- create this character for me. <laughs> yeah, it's like that's the Marvel method here. Wow. Holy cow, it's like you really, really do get the sense of how much work Barry Windsor Smith or or any artist has to do at Marvel Comics. Well, I mean, again, you hear the story about Jack Kirby creating the Silver Surfer. Yeah, totally. Stanley didn't didn't even know who it was. Amazing. Okay, so... Wow, that is funny. Yeah, totally funny. We better get into the issue here. Uh, this is The Coming of Conan, the first issue, uh, and we we get introduced to the whole world of Conan. It's it, We're in the middle of a war, and this is the war not between Conan's people, but, but he's in Vanaheim, one of the, the nations, and this is a war between the people of Vanaheim, which are like the Norse people of Norse mythology, and then uh, the people of the neighboring uh, country of Acer. Now, we're going to talk about um, the pronunciation of a lot of these names because... Yes, these are because all... it is going to be a challenge. <laughs> it is. And I think one of the first things we should talk about is Conan's name himself. He, is he Conan the Sumerian or the Cimmerian? The Sumerian. Okay, I, that's what I've always said as well, but I listened to an audio book just recently that says Cimmerian. I'm like, oh, have I been doing this wrong the whole time? So, Well, you know, I've always said Cimmerian, but actually looking at it in print, I could see why someone would say Cimmer. Actually, no, I can't even say it because I'm yeah. Cimmerian. It's Cimmer, Cimmerian, or Sim, Cimmerian. Huh. <laughs> it could be either. I'll be danged. Well, I'm going to keep on saying Sumerian because that's what I've yes. always said myself reading through this book. Um, okay, perfect. Yeah, so through the battle, Conan has to decide which side he's on because he's caught in the middle of it. So he chooses the uh, the Norse people of Vanaheim and he makes friends with this one guy. And through the course of this issue, we find that uh, they are being they get attacked by these flying winged creatures. And like we just mentioned, the cute girl that... Um, that Conan gets locked up with ends up turns out that she's one of them in the end. The story itself is okay. It's not that notable except for the fact that we are introduced to Conan and we get a yep. cool flash forward or flashback and flash forward uh, page right in the middle that kind of gives us a little hint of Conan's past and his future. Yep. Um, I think it's a, I think it's a very good introduction to him and his world. Yeah. Stories. Simple, straightforward, you know, yep. uh, I can see, I was actually wondering if, if it may have confused Marvel readers at the time because, uh, you know, because of Asgard. Right. Asgard I, is a country in this. Only they spell it with an A-E-S in this version, not the Thor's A-S version. Yeah, they make no uh th- they make no mention of like thor or anything to do with marvel comics and i think that's very intentional in fact the spelling of asgard is probably very intentional for that reason as well mm-hmm. uh, but like you said this is a good introduction to conan what i like about this is it, it lets us know right away that conan is a man of honor even though he's a barbarian uh that doesn't mean that he like just goes around fighting and killing people for sport he only really does it uh for for a purpose, if someone is being attacked or there's an injustice of sure. some sort, that's who Conan is right here. Yep, with uh, yep. Olaf is the character he decides to save. Yes, simply because he was uh, being outnumbered. 
Right. It wasn't a fair fight. So Olaf it wasn't a fair fight. And you are right. I mean, in all of and that's the thing that Roy Thomas gets so right about the character of Conan is uh, if Conan decides that he's going to help you, then you got him there forever. Yeah, exactly. Period. He's lo- completely loyal. I love that. I think such a strong start to this character makes me really root for him right from the beginning. Yep. It's interesting to note, I think, that you know uh, Roy Thomas specifically made note to make sure that these stories start when Conan's only a teenager. Yeah, that's true. I think he's supposed to be 18 or 19 in this. He's very um, young, and he's not the typical. the The way he's drawn here as well is not the typical like over muscular Arnold Schwarzenegger mm-hmm. type either. He's very thin, which makes him uh, kind of life in the way he moves. Uh, he's quick and fast. Sure, like as I referenced before, I have a good friend who is a Conan fan who always says there are three different versions of Conan: the movie version, the book version, and the Marvel Comics version. But that is a trait that should always be noted is that Conan's not just a lumbering, bulky barbarian. He is fast. Yeah. Uh, It really shattered my preconceptions of this character, um, of being the, the, you know, over steroid type of a Mm -hmm. just all all warrior, all fighting macho kind of guy. Now, there's a lot of macho in here. And I find that um, there's a lot of... um, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> There's a lot of phallic imagery in these books. If if it were, if you want to go in that direction, and you know how, I mean, I don't know if you know <laughs> or not, but um, Freud always um, he talks about the concept of man versus himself, and yes. I I think that this this comes out in this this book here. Like Conan is always trying to best um, men that are bigger than him. He's always yep. climbing <laughs> towers. Like there's towers all throughout this book. It's all and it's all about wow. swords. Like he's always handling swords and all of the the creatures that he is like there's always squids with tentacles or, or elephants with long trunks and like it's all throughout this book. Uh, <laughs> you I'll, know? Be, I'll be dead honest with you Curtis. I've read these I you're 100% right. I've never noticed that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's definitely like you can read it in that way. It's like this is an over macho kind of like a man, you know, always con- conquering the <laughs> himself in that in that sense. Snakes. There's a lot of snakes. <laughs> lot, yeah, God, you're right. <laughs> I guess yeah, the whole, the whole uh, worshippers of Set and all that. Yep. Um, it should be noted that this first issue uh was not based on any established robert e howard story uh because there was that odd loophole at first where marvel only had the rights to conan the character Ah. they didn't have the rights to robert e howard's uh stories just yet so that's why thomas created this all on his own Okay. I read uh, some interviews with him where he mentioned uh, that he made sure to include uh, the three checklist, and that's magic, monsters, and a pretty woman. <laughs> okay, that's cool. That's good to know because that does that's that's kind of a, a staple throughout the all of these issues. So, very cool. Absolutely. Um, yeah, my thoughts on that issue is a great introduction. Um, I can't say that enough. I mean, it is an issue that I find myself reading numerous times. Let's talk about let's talk about this uh this flash forward that we see yes. here, um because we have a uh, uh we have a little look at King Cull we we get a little bit of his history of Atlantis sinking he references Atlantis a lot which means that it's a very yep. important part of his past but we don't really know why yeah um that goes into uh, a little bit of and you'll get more into it later of robert e howard's essay the hyborian age you know where he wrote out pretty much an entire history of the world that he was of conan's world yeah um king call was you know a great bar no he wasn't a barbarian he was a warrior king I mean, if you want to fast forward a little bit, it is referenced because there are ideas that Sumerians are actually descendants of Atlanteans. Ah, uh-huh. okay. Um, you know, there's always a reference of the Great Cataclysm yep. that came during the Hyborian Age that wiped out Atlantis and uh, Lumeria. And in that essay, Robert E. Howard wrote, again, after thousands of years, Sumerians were slight descendants of that. So that's why King Kong, sh- King Kong shows up. I almost said King Kong. 
<laughs> and then we get a glimpse into the future uh, where Conan is crowned the king of the Hyborian Empire. Yep. I love that it pretty much tells you the end of the story right there. Yeah. And that Conan knows the end of the story now, too. He's got a glimpse of his own future. Um, and so he's he makes reference to the fact that he's going to become king uh, if, in issues to come as well. Like, he knows that this is going to come to pass. He just has to wait for that time to come. And I wonder if that also means that he is being more bold and more daring himself because he knows he can't die because he's predestined to have a crown on his head at some point. Well, now, the only... Uh, the only reason I would disagree with that is because at the end of this, it almost hints that after, because he's seeing these images because of the star stone, yeah. this purple glowing uh, gem that crashed, you know, into the, I guess the, the earth, it does take place on earth and he shatters the star stone. And at the end of the issue, it is hinted that he doesn't remember much. Okay. But he does remember the fact that he sees the, himself as a king because he makes mention of that uh, in one of the later he issues does. in this book. He does. He, re he definitely will reference uh, becoming a king by his own hand. Yeah. Uh, the art in this, in this issue is interesting to see. He uses a lot of very big panels. In fact, the first few pages of the story are only like three or four panels per page. And that is something that I think he's doing because he's a rookie um mm. i think that he got a he has this bare bare bones plot from roy so he's breaking yeah, it that's down a good point. so maybe he's uh filling out an issue he's fill, trying to fill out an issue uh as as easily as he can probably especially since this is a war is a battle he probably doesn't <laughs> doesn't want to draw these battle sequences in many small tiny panels yeah, very good point. But you can flip through to the back to the end to the last few issues of this book where his panels are standard six six panels or more. Mm -hmm. So he's learning a whole lot as he's going on. Uh, and you can see right at the very beginning that he's just I think he's he's not qu quite getting what he's supposed well, you, to be doing here. Going back to that listener comment you read, did you read these 13 issues and it, it is a comic course? Yeah. It is. You can literally watch Barry Windsor Smith become a, a legend in the field. Yep, quite amazing. Um, I do love the very last page where we get um, a half-page splash of just Conan's big old face here. Yep, um, I'm looking at that right now. Yeah, and it's not at all how he draws Conan, even in the second issue, because he he ends up giving Conan a much bigger brow and a much pointier, like a um, a, a narrow chin with high cheekbones, and so. Uh, that doesn't come off quite in that one issue or in this whole issue mm. here. But I, I just love the, the detail, the shading and, and everything that he's given in this one big, yeah. big panel. Very nice. Absolutely. Um, also in this epic collection in the bonus features are comments on the cover of this story because uh, Barry did the cover and it was inked by John Verpoten and he makes a lot of changes, just minor changes in the way that Barry drew, like, a, for instance, one of the biggest examples is the sword in Conan's uh, right hand. Barry drew the sword much longer, and it goes in behind that axe that's being held mm -hmm. in the foreground, and John thought that the, the point of the blade should be seen, so he shortened the point so that mm. you could actually see the whole sword. So little things like probably, that. Probably, that's probably for the best. I think so, too. I think so, too. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, man, we're already almost an hour into... Um, the podcast here, and we've only gone through the first issue, so we should keep on going here and uh, talk about issue number two, Lair of, Lair of the Beast Men. This one is the first issue where we get Sal Buscema as an anchor, and right away, I think that this is a good choice because... Oh, absolutely. Um, this allows Barry to spend more time on um, on the pencils and on the story because he doesn't have to fit inking into his schedule now. Um, so he, you can already tell that he is putting more detail into the backgrounds. He's got more panels on his pages. And this means that also Sal can bring his expertise, although he's still fairly new to the field also yeah, at this point. Yeah, that's, that's interesting to put in perspective when you think about that. But he's still got more experience than Sal. So he's bringing things like uh, just the, sh the shading, the way he uses yeah. blacks. Um, the 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 motion lines and all that kind of stuff. Th these are some. From signature. what I understand, uh, Sal actually changed uh, some of the art in this issue. In that opening page where you see Conan uh, standing over one of the beast men that was originally just a bear. 
Ah, wow. that Barry Windsor Smith drew. That's a big change. And Sal Buscema went in and changed it to actually one of the Beast Men. Now you talk about um, about Barry Windsor Smith being a Kirby clone in these early early issues, and it really comes out in this in this issue because yes. these Beast Men are such Kirby esque characters in the way that their helmets, their armor is all. Um, I'll, I'll you compose. could put those in his fir- in his fourth world. Absolutely, you can. And same with the world that the underground world that they're taken to, uh, very very Kirby-ish, Kirby-esque. Yep. This was uh, this issue was based on a literal snippet again from the Hyborian Age essay that Robert E. Howard wrote. Uh, it's a really quick two line thing about uh, again saying it out loud. Some of the tribes of Numeria pushing. A other tribes of these snow creatures further north to basically kill them into the Arctic Circle, and then thousands of years later, finds out that they didn't die and that they travel every once in a while to capture basically human slaves yeah. to do all their bidding. Yeah, I love it. I think this is great. It's very kind of Planet of the Apes ish, which would have been very popular yes. at the time. Um, Very especially true. with like all of this imagery with the humans in their cages and stuff, it's so Planet yeah. of the Apes. And how yeah, the humans are you know we would never talk back to our masters and yep. things like that. Great dialogue in this. Uh, you yeah. know, I love that the just the sheer presence of Conan uh, inspires the human slaves to revolt it's and so rise good. up. Yep, totally. Uh, one of the things I wanted to note, you just mentioned great dialogue. Uh, we never hear Conan's internal monologue, ever. And this, True. Is, this is one of the things that we know about Conan through these first 13 issues, is that he only talks when he needs to. There yep. are long periods where he just won't say anything at all. And so the narration that Roy hmm. puts in here is very, very important because it tells us what Conan is thinking. It tells us why he's doing the things he's doing. And it tells us about kind of just the, the, uh, the poeticness about Conan himself. This is, the, this is like a minstrel telling a story or like telling us the, the legend of Conan. It's so important. And if you are the type of person who goes to these old Marvel comics and skips over the dialogue boxes because you think comics are too wordy, you're really, really <laughs> missing out on a lot of important information about Conan. Yeah, Roy Yeah, Roy Thomas is a master of that. Um, one of my favorite moments being when uh, the... God, I can't remember the character's name. The basically cured. That's it. The, the Charlton Heston character? <laughs> yes. Gives Conan a knife to kill himself. Conan says, like, you're giving me this to kill myself, then I'll do something else with it, thanks. Yeah, I love it at the very end also. Uh, Conan defeats, he ends up defeating the all of the beast men and the king of the beasts, and he takes the crown and places it on Kiord's head. Kiord is the human, yep. uh, even though Kiord has died as well. And I love the words here. It says, yes, thralls, that's the slaves, you are free now. Y- uh, and and long may you remain so, but let your legend say of this day that a king led you to victory and that his name was Kiord, for he was the last of the manlings, but first among men. So great. I, I just love it. <laughs> great. Yep. I, I think it's funny. I'm a huge Planet of the Apes fan. Never put that together, but again, you're 100% right. It's such a great, uh, great story. Yep. I think Roy did that often. Roy, Roy, I think, is known for taking movie plots and turning them into his comics, and I think this is just a blatant uh, Planet of the Apes thing. Yeah, yeah, I'll take more of it. Because, yeah, this was, the I think, the first one that was uh, nominated for an award also. Oh, yeah. Because right, early on in these issues, uh, it Conan automatically started getting attention. Like it, comics did from uh, other comic creators, but I think that was the first one that was nominated for uh, like an actual internal comic award. Okay, that's very cool. It, it deserves it. It's a great issue. Yeah, like I said, the sheer presence of Conan leads men to revolt. And then in this next issue, number three, it's called The Twilight of the Grim Grey God. And it says here at the bottom, freely adapted from Robert E. Howard's story, The Grey God Passes. Yeah, it's more of a poem, actually. And I'm going to be dead honest with you, I didn't have access to it. I tried, I looked through all of my Robert E. Howard stuff. It is one of the few things I could not find. Oh, okay. Um, I do know that, again, obviously, it should be good. It was not originally a Conan uh, story. 
it was one that Roy Thomas read and used his abilities to just, just like the previous issue, just kind of change a few things here and there and put Conan in that, um, to me, it goes to show you uh, that Conan is such a great character. Yeah. That you can fit him into these stories that weren't even made for him. This story, I actually, I, I liked it, but I ended up having to read it twice. Yep, yep. Because... It's actually not my favorite. Yeah, it, it's a little bit of a confusing one. We Yes, I found the same thing. He comes into a war, and I just couldn't keep track of which side was of who, of who was on which side. And they're like, there's characters that are completely. they're drawn kind of the same. So I was reading it, thinking that this was one character, but it was actually the other character. And then like, yes, I yeah, it was it was a little it confusing. was a little bit confusing. Uh, to me, again, Conan kind of a background character in it. Yep. You know, uh, it starts with him coming across a giant gray, quote unquote, God. You know, he doesn't realize who it is, but, uh, you know, the gray being tells him this foreshadowing of a great war that's coming and kings dying and sounds great. But then when you start getting to it, there's a lot of uh, (laughs) backstabbing and a lot of, you know, uh, lovers quarrels and such. Yeah. And I think, uh, yeah, there's two female characters that I, that's who I kept getting confused. Yes, I got them confused, but then I also got the the king and the barbarian confused at times as well. The girls I got confused because they're both, they both try and use Conan for yes. different purposes. And it's like, I thought that one was using him for the uh, the purpose for the other army. And I was like, yeah, who, <laughs> and like, yeah. was this the king in disguise meeting to going to meet this woman or was he like, that's funny. Cause at the very end, I did the same thing. I was like, what did I just read? <laughs> I see Conan, I see Conan's uh, leaving. I was like, should we be cheering or yeah. What just happened? Now maybe it's like supposed to be like a, a tale on the uh, you know pointlessness of war or such. Yeah, I think you know, so. Considering everyone dies at the end, uh, I did think it was kind of cool because again, Conan is kind of just pops up to uh, ruin a few plans. You know, again, there is this whole subplot of backstabbing, and well, we're gonna fake a truce, and then I'm not going to go through with it. And, yeah, it, and that it, was it a little bit convoluted, <laughs> and that and because the characters are kind of all drawn the same, that added to the confusion yes. because like who's betraying whom and and all that kind of stuff. Um, you notice that there are a lot of panels in in this issue in each page, mm-hmm. and this tells me I think that maybe Roy had given a much more detailed plot than he did for that first issue, and could be maybe he was a little bit ambitious and and this is all theoretical um but didn't he had more plot than the pages allowed for so Barry Windsor Smith is trying to cram so much into all of these pages like some of these panel, panel some of these pages have 10 panels in them and it's like all dialogue based and and stuff but yeah you know uh a note i made about this issue was it read kind of poetic to me <laughs> And yeah. I'm not one that usually reads poetry. And if this is based on a poem, then yep. that could be. Page 16 of this issue has 13 panels in it. Wow. <laughs> yeah, you're good at you're good at noticing stuff like that. Uh, yeah, so that, I will say, though, it's well drawn, and the, the battle sequences are really nice. He, I like them better than the mm-hmm. battle sequences we see in the first issue. But yeah, overall, ah, the story was too confusing for... Yeah. For for its worth. Yeah, don't disagree on that one. Issue number four, Tower of the Elephant. This is the one that the listeners, the listener comments uh, refer to a couple times as being the standout in this issue. And I would have to agree. There's a lot of great stuff happening here. Yes. Uh, now, I guess my question to you is, since you're more sci-fi, do you think there's some sci-fi in this? Oh, absolutely. I was very surprised at how kind of Steve Ditko this issue gets <laughs> toward the back half here. That's solid. That's a solid point. Uh, this should be noted that this was obviously the first direct Robert E. Howard adaptation that they did yeah. in the Marvel comics. And it was simply because of the popularity. Uh, by this point, Conan was already, those comics were selling so well that uh, they were uh, springing uh, a little bit more money and actually got some rights to the stories 
Now, this, these issues were originally published bi-monthly, which means that mm -hmm. um, by this point, issue number four, almost a year had passed since Conan's debut. Uh, and so wow. we have, uh, that's, that does give them enough time, because you said originally they didn't have the license to include these kind of stories. But uh, yeah, they, they had enough time to re recognize the popularity and put a little bit more money into this. So yeah, now we have yep. this issue that's firmly based in Conan lore. Now, did you read the original story? Oh, absolutely. This is, yeah, I don't disagree. Well, you know, it's tough because I love all of Conan, but this is one of the most classic Conan stories. And I will say that um, it's funny, you, earlier in the episode you mentioned it, but the biggest difference between this story and the actual Robert E. Howard is just simply gore. Okay. It gets a lot more graphic in the original story um, to get ahead in the story when he actually comes across the elephant of uh, Yog Kosha. Yog Kosha. Yog Kosha. Yeah, that's right. Yog Kosha being the elephant that he comes upon uh, in the story. Conan, in a rather graphic description, cuts out his heart and has to squeeze it over the gem oh. that he later uses to defeat Yar, the, the sorcerer that has imprisoned the elephant. Right. So the, the point of this story is that Conan is uh, faced with an impossible task of scaling a glass tower. How can you scale something that is so smooth that uh, you can't grip it? That is something that we come to learn. Sumerians are good at climbing. Yes. <laughs> He's always climbing towers. Um, and so he, he goes on this quest to try and get up this tower and is met alongside this other guy who... Um, who, who joins him for his journey, yes. There's supposed to be a legendary thief in his own right. And they're both going to go for uh, the gem at the top. Yes, but, because uh, apparently the rumor is around the city that the heart of the elephant is supposed to be like the greatest treasure to ever exist. And Conan says, kind of bluntly, in the middle of this city of thieves, well, why haven't any of you even tried? Like, you know, and so, of course, everyone in the in the tavern kind of have their own opinions and go and cause them cowards, you know, says I can climb that tower. No, no problem. Yep. And then does. He does. Yeah. In fact, both of them do. Yep. And but uh, once they get to the top, um, his buddy uh, Taurus doesn't last that long. Yep. He turns out that he was using Conan to kind of just uh, get through some obstacles. You know, once they get to the top, he kind of like locks him out. Then finds Toro's dead. Uh, in the book, it goes into a little bit more of a, you know, uh, it's a little bit more of a mystery. How did this, how did Toro's die? I think in the issue here, it's, they they tell you how pretty fast. Uh, it's a giant spider. Yeah, it's a giant spider. <laughs> now, does, does Roy use a lot of the dialogue... Uh, and narration from the book. He actually does. Uh, I, I Actually, it's funny. Before we even did this, about two years ago, I sat down and I started reading uh, these comics in the same time I was reading the original Robert E. Howard, and I was amazed at how much dialogue you would take directly from it. Okay. Um, I mean, some of it is word for word. In fact, I tried to make notes, and it's such minor stuff. It wasn't even really worth noting. Uh, maybe like a name here and there. Barely, uh, right, but right. again, it's he was so good at adapting it into a comic story. I guess you know the thing that Robert E. Howard was so good at is you being able to read his stories and visualize it. But yeah, you know, obviously with comic books, it's a completely different format. So at the end of this issue, when he meets up with the sorcerer that has imprisoned the elephant creature, uh, Conan sends him into the gem, the heart of the elephant. The heart of the elephant. And we get this one panel at the very uh, page 19 at the very bottom of the, of the here. And this is what I was mentioning is like very Steve Ditko, where we get that very strange, otherworldly, um, yes. abstract kind of like of, of backgrounds and whatnot. Of the, just yes. imagine Doctor Strange going into one of the, the dark dimension or something God, like that, that. That would be so cool seeing Ditko doing some of that. And I think that he does. I think that. Um, Barry Windsor Smith is actually kind of a nice blend between Kirby and Ditko. We yeah, have, I can totally see that. We have, the, yeah, I mean, the strong, solid nature of Kirby with the the maybe the odd proportions and a uh, little bit more um, abstract version of of the way Ditko draws. But yeah, yeah, this and is if great. You, uh, 
It could just should be noted that if you go by original 1930s Conan continuity, uh, this was the first story that Robert E. Howard wrote in his continuity, but not, not published. actually wrote, if that makes sense. It's not published first, but it was... Yeah, and that's the one thing about Conan is that all of the stories are sort of published. They, they just yes. pick out a point in time of Conan, right? It's yep. not They're not published I mean, in order. The first story that Robert E. Howard ever wrote was Conan as a king. There you so go. So yeah. in that flashback that we talked about, that's the first story he ever wrote, Phoenix on the Sword. Ah. Uh, yeah, so that's interesting. Yeah, this was such a great adaptation of that story, and actually they redid it again for Savage Sword with John Buscema drawing it. Oh, man, wow. Yeah. Very cool. And they got a little bit more. Again, that's where they were pulling back a little bit on that comics code. Right, because the, the magazine didn't have to have the same the same issues with gore and such as the comics did, so I would love to see that. Yeah, and I, as, much as, that as much as I love Barry Windsor Smith, I'm more of a John Buscema fan. Yeah. So that was that's especially great to seek out. I'd agree there. Okay, moving on to issue number five, Zukala's Daughter. And this one, uh, again, says, inspired by the poem Zukala's Hour, written by Robert E. Howard. And I was able to find this poem online, so I was able to read that. And it's, it's very loosely based on the yes. poem. <laughs> very loosely based. Um, uh, I think even I read the poem. The poem's not exactly long. So again, it goes to Roy Thomas's ability to adapt. Yeah, and take take the themes and really expand on it. So he goes to uh, Zamora. That's where he is now. Um, and he is in a town where everybody hides at night because the town is attacked, or once a month the town is attacked by a beast. And if they don't pay a, a tithe of some sort, then the beast will destroy their, you know, their shops or whatever, their their mer- their marketplace uh, stands. So Conan's like, that's not right. What can possibly be going on here? And he finds out that... Uh, um, oh, well, it's what it is, is that he's trying to buy a sword and the merchant's charging him some ridiculous amount of money. Right. <laughs> Because and the Conan guy needs, says, yeah. why would you... He's like, that's ridiculous. And the guy says, well, I need it's the because money. we're getting attacked by a tiger every night. Yeah, this it's one every had, night? What, yeah, they did. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, well, no, yeah, I think you were right before. Every 40 gold uh, every month. And, you know, that's, so that's why all the prices in this little village are so huge. Yeah, everyone's trying to make their quota for the month. So they yeah. don't get eaten by a tiger. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Uh, turns out that the tiger is actually a woman that turns into a tiger. And so Conan is like, what the heck? Uh, oh, he doesn't find that out for a little while later, though. But he he, he goes into this tower. He has to, uh, to try and find out what's going on that's causing all these guys to be attacked by a tiger. Yep, and that's where you start getting some actual adaptations of the direct poem in there of when he's first like kind of sulking through this tower. That's when he actually, uh, Roy Thomas actually takes some lines directly from the poem and puts them in. Yeah, so like the 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 demon of Jagta Noga. That's um, one of those. Yep, I think that's pretty spot on. Jagta Noga. Yeah, so that's 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 taken from the poem, and uh, and we get yeah this this one sorcerer here who um is like hiding half of his face and stuff, and he I guess is uh, related to the woman who. Is it his? Is her father? I can't it's remember. His daughter. Yeah, yep. I mean, yeah. Yep, that's Zukala. Zukala is, uh, yeah, the daughter of this guy. Kind of typical, just evil sorcerer that's squeezing this village for just sheer greed. We'll see that a just few to times. Kind of show power. Yep. Uh, and if they don't please him, he'll send out his daughter, who can turn into a tiger. Once she kind of falls for Conan, because you mentioned it, it should be noted that pretty much every woman that Conan <laughs> encounters falls for him. Yep. Um, and then Zukala summons, yeah, the, the dimensional demon Jaga Nogaga, like yeah. you said before. <laughs> uh, this was a great issue to me uh, all around. I did find it a little bit uh, funny, you know, because Zukala is kind of all over the place with his motivations. He orders, you know, this demon to kill his daughter because his daughter you know, betrayed him because of Conan, but then after the demon does, Zukala instantly regrets it and says, all right, I'm sending you back. I can't believe you actually did that. Okay, so that's an interesting point you make because there is a maybe a reason for that. Okay. Here's an article from Conan Saga number 75 from 1993. 
Uh, this is written by Roy. He says, One of the more pleasurable experiences of my years in comics was the early days of Conan the Barbarian. The title's first artist, of course, was young Barry Smith, now Barry Windsor Smith, who was then residing in native London. When in 1970, Marvel acquired the rights to Robert E. Howard's Conan, circumstances combined to make Barry the right person, the right time, and even in the right place, since we couldn't have cared less if he drew the stories in New York, England, or Timbuktu. The third Conan story that Barry penciled was entitled Zukala's Daughter, though for various mm -hmm. reasons it wound up appearing instead in Conan number five, switching places with the tale The Twilight of the Grim Grey God. Uh, the final two pages of Zukala's Daughter were partially repenciled by Barry prior to being scripted. Uh, and then in this epic collection, they actually show a photostat of wow. the original page, uh, the original two pages um, that, are, that were redrawn. And it says here... On page 19, working from my plot, which is long since lost, so I can't double-check exactly what I asked him to draw, Barry had penciled a sequence which caused a bit of a problem. As a glance at the next page will show, Conan slices the demon Jagta Noga with an axe and knocks him out the window where he falls to his doom. Now, Jagta Noga was all but indestructible, and earlier that same issue, we'd seen him flying through the air. In a note in the uh -huh. border, in a note in the border, Barry realizes the inherent paradox, for he wrote, "Losing balance, too exhausted to fly." That's a bit sticky, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, it was. And after that, we talked briefly by phone, and Barry penciled a new panels to panels one and four wherein Zukala instead sends Jagta Noga back to the netherworld from which he was not to return until Conan the Barbarian issue number 115. <laughs> that's a long way away. Yeah. Well, that's interesting because I was going to note that this is the first introduction of a reoccurring character. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay, and then so on page 20, here's more to what you were talking about earlier. On page 20, Zukala 2 fades away, but in the original version, Barry drew, and it's quite possible that my plot had asked him to draw, Zukala's daughter Zephra dead by Jack Tanaga's indiscriminate hand. For whatever long-forgotten reason, we decided that Zephra should live, so panels 4 and 5 were redrawn, and her lifeless head was, ex from, was removed from panel 6. When Conan left the, t the castle Zukala, he didn't know that he was fated to meet again with the pair in Conan number 14 and 15, which is going to be in the first is issues that we'll talk about in volume two. Zephra, who finally did bite the big one in the famed crossover with Michael Moorcock, Moorcock's Elric of Melinbione, <laughs> has been given a 10-issue lease on life, courtesy of Barry's skillful pencils. So I haven't read that one yet. Um, yeah, that's actually one I. I'm curious if the if that'll be is that included in the next epic with uh, his team up with uh, Elric. Let me see here. What I'm just curious if like it's, if that was one of those weird rights thing if they were able to reprint that. Um. Yeah, Elric and his soul sealing sword, sword Stormbringer. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, so it will oh, be in great. There. Okay, that was a lot of to say that uh, the daughter you were talking about his motivations and such. Yeah. The motivations, I think, change if he doesn't kill his daughter in the end. Well, again, like I said, this is the first time you, and they, again, somewhat spoiler, they show back up in issues 14 and 15, which are the things that start the next epic. But, uh, I mean, maybe it was also a case of, uh, you know, Conan needing a, a rogues gallery. Well, I mean, if you want to establish continuity, like a, an ongoing serialized story, you can't be yep. an anthology-based storytelling forever. Yep. you got to have some sort of con continuity. Now, the problem with Conan is that he's a wanderer, and so like, as soon as he leaves the country, is he really going to randomly bump into any of these people again? Probably not. He's got to stay in the sure. same place. The big than world. <laughs> yeah. Um, but then when we move into the next issue, we're going to meet a character yep. that sticks around for a number of issues. Yep, she is definitely uh, becomes a main character of this almost. This is issue number six. It's called Devil Wings Over Shadazar. And uh, yeah, we are introduced to this new character named Jenna, like you said. Um, she will be uh, a regular for the throughout the rest of this volume. And I, and I have no idea. Well, yeah, I have no idea if she comes back later on. I hope so. So Conan wanders into a new town. Uh, what is this town called? Uh, Zam Zamer uh, it's Shadazar. Oh, it's Shad the, the town is called Shadazar, right. Yep. And it's run by one called Shadazar the Wicked. And this is so strange because here's another tower. There's another tower in this one. Yep. Uh, in the tower, they have to give, they, they sacrifice um, 
you know, people from their town to their, their bat god. And so they take Jenna. Jenna is the one who they're going to sacrifice and Conan has to go save her. Yep. We're uh, interested- also introduces two recurring characters of Fafnir and Black Rat. They actually do show up a couple of times later. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and we're also introduced just to the, the world of Shadazar, since we're going to stick around here for a little while. Uh, mm-hmm. All of these, these priests that are cloaked in red, they become kind of the adversaries for the, throughout these next couple, couple of issues. They're just kind of the goons. brothers of blood, I believe they were called, or I think so, yeah. Knights of blood, or a, yeah, like you said, they kidnap a an unsuspecting. I think they do. I think they do specifically say female. Pretty much yep. every night, um, you know, earlier Conan meets Jenna, who you know convinces him to melt all of his gold down into the shape of a heart, so that it's easier to carry. Uh, then she disappears. They get attacked by these knights in red, and she, you know, he wakes up and she's gone. You know, of course, he vows that he's going to get her back. Uh, I don't know about the epic collections because I'm looking, but like these panels are all blacked out, which I liked when he's fighting these knights in dark. You know, he's not able to see really all that well. Yeah. So in the epic collection, they are all. It's all like shades of blue. Like the backgrounds mm-hmm. are all black. But the color yep. palette is all blue. I was going to actually make a note about the colors in this issue because it stands out to me more than some of the other issues. You know, back then, the, the, they have limited amount of colors that they can use in a comic book. Mm-hmm. So you have to be creative. Of course, the, the really standout colors are the primary colors. And so, like, the, the robes on these guys, the red robes really stand out. The blues really stand out. And they make good use of, um, of fire in this issue. Yes. Uh, once the bat... Once, once Conan's at the top of the tower and they're fighting that giant bat, the yep. the glow of the fire turns the the bat orange a lot, which really gives a sense of the heat and the the lighting. Um, on page uh, eighteen, the very first panel in page eighteen, Conan's mm-hmm. holding like a a stick with with a lantern yep. or a torch on it or something, yep. and uh, and just the glow from that, the 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 burning that you can see, the the harsh yellow. That's that you can see over the bat's face. Plus, the um, Conan has red on him as well to show that mm-hmm. you know, there's still the heat, but it's mimicking a shadow. It just looks really, really cool. I really like the, the yes. way they're using. The I love that. I love that initial reveal of the giant bat. Oh yeah, because that's like again. That should be noted. It turns out these knights are literally just worshiping a giant bat that comes out every night and eats people. And it eats people because it's hungry. It's not because of nope. the sacrifice, but they're making it, nope. it just convenient it just, for the bats. Like, thanks for feeding dinner. me, humans. <laughs> yeah, it's great. I love just how large these creatures are in the in this world here. Like, we've already had a giant bat. We've got the elephant person. We've got the yeah. the giant spider. Um, and they're just going to get bigger as they go along. So I should note, uh, I think this is uh, uh, something that Roy Thomas did on purpose that you don't get in the original stories of Conan. I would say it bluntly. Uh, Roy Thomas has Jenna save Conan. Uh, uh, yeah. You know, it's the first time you actually see, I'll say the female, actually save Conan instead of vice versa. At the very end, when he's knocked unconscious from defeating the bat and the head priestess is about to kill him while he's unconscious, Jenna comes up with the torch and uh, kills her. And, you know, obviously that's going to form a bond. Conan doesn't forget stuff like that. I think that Roy is definitely aware of uh, of the time that he's writing these in because, yeah, the, there are women and damsels, damsels in distress in each one of these mm-hmm. issues, but they actually can hold their own a lot of the times. And as we get further into this volume, even like there's the later story where the woman, uh, the slave becomes the queen in the end um, because she can hold yes. her own. And uh this is the this is the seventies, right? The early seventies, and we have yep. the whole uh, the women's lib movement is happening, and Marvel is sure. launching books like She Even, Hulk yep. and Ms. Marvel, and uh, yep, the claws of the cat, and yeah. So I'm pretty sure that uh, that Roy is looking at these female characters and looking at the way they are written decades ago in the Conan books. And thinking, you know, maybe I need to change yep. up the way that the women are being treated here. And so they're still, you know, it's they're still I can't. It should be but... noted that he that she does rob him at the end. Yes, <laughs> she stole it. that she takes the heart of gold that he made, which is another thing that Conan will not forget. Yep, it's so interesting the relationship between these two because it's like she she 
backstabs him at every chance that she can get throughout all of these issues. But he still kind of follows her around and is taken yep. by her. Her god's name is Mitra, so he she calls out to Mitra yep. all the time, and he calls out to Krom. Of course. That is actually something that Robert E. Howard was wonderful at. Was uh, I love his description of Krom. Anyone who doesn't know that that is Conan's god, that's a whole thing to go into later. I love his, yeah, his description. He just describes Krom as, you know, the greatest warrior, but can care less about the things that happen with humans, yep. so he doesn't get involved. <laughs> basically, like, Sumerians think, like, Krom created you with enough strength to basically take care take of yourself, care of, yeah, so don't right. bother praying to him. Yeah. Okay, you know what? At this point here, uh, we are halfway, th- not even halfway through the book, and we are we are hitting a, an hour and a half before I, I do the <laughs> editing. So we could easily spend another 45 minutes to an hour talking about the rest of these issues. So I think we should come back next week and make two episodes out of this. What do you think, Jason? Perfectly fine by me. Okay, let's do that. Let's stop here and uh, give our listeners a chance to catch up with the rest of these issues if you haven't read them yet. Uh, the back half of this book is excellent. So I'm looking forward to talking with you um, about these ones. But uh, yeah, let's, let's wrap it up for today. That's all we're going to talk about here. We'll be back next week talking about Conan issues numbers uh, 7 to 13. Sounds great. Thanks again, Jason, for being a part of this episode uh, and for talking Conan with us. Thank you for having me. And we'll see everybody next week. Bye. Bye.